coded. Professor Margo Kaminsky uh, from the Wolf Law School. She thinks about issues of privacy. She thinks about issues of surveillance. She thinks about, wait a second. Do you guys care about internet? Yes. Quiet. What you really <laughs> care about is that this is the seminar in technology, cybersecurity, and policy. Technology, cybersecurity, and policy. This is a policy maven. She has thought deeply and scholarly about many issues that affect the policy of people in the United States and also in the European Union. So without further ado and no more delays, please welcome Professor Kaminsky. Thank you so much. So um, this is a kind of strange project, and I'm hoping that it will be accessible enough, given the introduction, that will be of interest to you all. Um, by way of background, I started my career in law largely through the field of copyright law. So I came in through looking at intellectual property questions. I was working for a literary agency in New York City doing copyright contracts for major authors. Went to law school, actually went to law school via Creative Commons. Has anybody heard of Creative Commons? Yes, yeah, so that was like Lawrence Lessig's organization that was about what do we do when books go online. Um, so this is back in like 2004. Um, so I go to law school thinking I'm going to do intellectual property law. And I get introduced to the concept of deep packet inspection because copyright uh, enforcement agencies were increasingly, and private actors were increasingly pushing to use deep packet inspection of internet content um, to try to perform copyright enforcement. And that got me queasy. <laughs> and I went to work for a summer at the Electronic Frontier Foundation in San Francisco as a Google Policy Fellow. Um, and there I basically began my shift from intellectual property law into privacy law. It's been a long, gradual process. Um, and as mentioned, in 2018, I had a Fulbright to go to the European Union to study comparative data privacy, um, which was incredibly, incredibly uh, temporarily lucky um, in that the European Union's big data privacy regulation, the General Data Protection Regulation, the GDPR, went into, inf went into effect in May 2018 while I was there. So I'll explain this later in the presentation, but in short, I went there thinking I was going to study privacy in drones. I came out with this project. Um, has anybody here been following the discussions about algorithmic fairness, accountability, transparency? Yeah, OK, so that's around half of you. So some of you will really know what I'm talking about, and some of you will have no idea. Um, in terms of the, the policy framing for this, this topic is basically considered to be, in the US, a subset of data privacy conversations slash an offshoot from data privacy conversations. Um, that's because the type of technology I'm going to be talking about here, which is largely machine learning algorithms, though also other kinds of algorithms, um, are trained on and make decisions based on extremely large data sets. And those data sets are gathered largely through you know, extensive data surveillance techniques um, that connect back to other concerns I've had about surveillance of online activity and surveillance of, of public places. OK, so without further ado, I want to start with the acknowledgment that humans are terrible decision makers. So you have a person here from the law school uh, note the little gavel up on the top. I'm admitting judges, too, terrible decision makers. Um, we make decisions with enormous amounts of bias. Uh, sometimes we make decisions that are outright discriminatory. Um, we have cognitive biases, which are different from discriminatory biases. They're sort of, they incline us to make bad decisions or incorrect decisions. Um, and I'm going to give a couple of examples of these in the next few slides. So <clears throat> of course, the law professor is using a study of law firms is an example of unconscious bias or subconscious bias. But there was a 2016 study, I believe, out of Harvard Business School that surveyed 316 offices of 147 law firms in 14 different cities uh, and looked at the top 1% of the class. They had identical employers and work history. And the only variation, um, so these were resumes that were sent to all these offices. The only variation in the resume was James versus Julia. Um, and basically a signal of social class. 
So these are kind of hilarious if you look at them. So it's like your resume says sailing team, you're from the higher class. And your resume says track and field team, you're a lower class combo. So similarly, um, if you got your personal interest includes polo and classical music, that's an upper class indicator. Your resume includes pickup soccer and country music. Those are lower class uh, indicators. All right, so they send these resumes varying gender and uh, class. And they find that the higher class man, so a combination of James with Polo, um, gets more than four times the callbacks of any other applicants. And this is more than all the other applicants in the study combined. Okay? Um, we're not suggesting, uh, or they're not suggesting in the study, that this is conscious bias. Um, they're suggesting that this is unconscious bias on the part of the law firm employers. And, and so question, yeah. do many of the people in the law firms listen to classical music, play polo, Yeah. Have the names of James, James or... versus Julia? Yeah, I mean, most law firm partners are male. Um, and uh, many are of higher socioeconomic classes. So it's absolutely replicating who they are. Absolutely. So that's an example of unconscious bias. Then we have examples throughout US history, including current US history, of outright discrimination by human decision makers. Does anybody know what redlining is? OK, great. So again, it's around half the class. Um, so redlining uh, is when banks um, took actual maps and would draw red lines around predominantly African American uh, occupied neighborhoods in order to indicate that those were neighborhoods that could not pay back loans. Right? They were neighborhoods that were deteriorating, that could not pay back loans, which meant that you had neighborhoods, this is from Philadelphia, you had neighborhoods in major cities across the country um, where African Americans failed to obtain home ownership because of these discriminatory practices by banks. So again, these are still our examples of humans being terrible decision makers. Um, if you uh, know the field of algorithmic bias and fairness at all, you know what I'm getting to. All right, last, um, we are horribly irrational. We distribute, or we display all kinds of cognitive biases. So we have an anchoring bias which is basically the thing you say to me first, I'm more likely to think is true. Confirmation bias, which is if I go into the impeachment hearings thinking that I know what the outcome is, I'm very unlikely to be swayed by all of the evidence. There's the endowment effect, um, which means that we're unreasonably unlikely to give up things we already have, even if they are of objectively little value. So that's your lost sock phenomenon, right? Like if you lose your sock in the laundry um, and you just can't let it go, that'd be me. Uh, that's the endowment effect. Um, and automation bias, which is relevant to this topic, uh, is that we like to trust machines. So we are more likely to trust an answer that we think was spit out, even by a machine we don't understand, um, than an answer that was handed to us by a human. Okay. So this brings me to the topic of this project, which is actually a series of papers by this point, um, algorithmic decision making. So algorithms, meaning in short, computer programs of varying types of complexity, um, are increasingly being used to make significant decisions about humans without the intervention of human decision makers, right? Um, this is happening at scale, so it's happening over large numbers of people uh, and at speed, so it happens really, really quickly, which means this is efficient decision making. Whether it's accurate is a different question. Um, it's seen as being, as I said, more efficient. It's seen as being more accurate, so not subject to discriminatory impulses, biased impulses, et cetera. Um, and it's seen as being less biased, and in fact, sometimes understood to be smarter than a human decision maker. Where is this being used? Uh, it's being used in the insurance context. So your insurance rates may be calculated by algorithms. Um, there's flow. Uh, it's being used in content moderation. So your experience of social networks, uh, your content that you're seeing is being produced largely by algorithmic moderation, though not perfectly. There's also human moderators in there. Um, it's being used in employment decisions, including by our own CU. So has anybody had to deal with the HireVue software? Yeah, so HireVue is a software that CU and other universities use to make hiring decisions. Um, there is a mode that you can use in hiring software, in HireVue, um, where you do a video and you ask the software to rate how honest the person is being or other traits. And they're running a facial recognition algorithm based on a data set that we don't know um, a lot about. And uh, they come up with an answer to, yes, this person is trustworthy, or yes, this person is um, you know, a reliable worker, or this person seems nervous, or this person seems like they're you know, terribly unfit for the job, 
Um, so it is used in the employment context. It's also used to screen resumes because obviously if you're a large, um, a large employer and you're receiving 20,000 resumes from online resume senders a year, uh, your HR team can't deal with that, so they use algorithmic filtration. It's being used probably most frighteningly in the criminal justice system um, where a fairly sketchy recidivism, risk recidivism software has been used in determining, um, so in some jurisdictions, determining sentencing length, <coughs> and others determining whether somebody gets bail versus is kept in prison. Um, and I believe that also actually traces back to a CU professor, though I might be misremembering that. Um, algorithmic decision making is being used in community surveillance and policing. In fact, Chicago actually just announced that it's going to stop doing this because it's been finding it ineffective in practice. But to highlight high risk areas, um, to decide uh, if particular areas should have more patrols, et cetera. So and, in the case of, of Chicago, yeah. how long has, have they been using that infrastructure? I don't remember. This is Andrew Ferguson's work. Um, it's been at least like at least five years. Um, and they only now, as part of civil liberties pushback and partially because it's not been working, only now announce that they're done. Um, so uh, it's used in targeted advertising. This is the one that's sort of most deeply connected to traditional privacy conversations, um, meaning that the ads that you see online uh, are personalized based on a profile, um, and the ads are largely being served to you based on what an algorithm says you should be served. Um, and this includes predatory ads like payday loan advertisements that end up targeted at minority communities, which suddenly looks a lot like the redlining we talked about earlier. Um, and on a more positive note, it's being used in targeted medicine. So algorithmic decision making is replacing doctors' decisions, most famously in a failed attempt, uh, IBM Watson, trying to determine, determine uh, whether people are likely to have a particularly rare cancer. Um, and a number of doctors have been more recently questioning whether it's actually accurate. OK. so. My first point, machines are actually not better than human decision making. The reason why machines are not better than human decision making is because machines are embedded within human decision making. They are designed by humans. They are overseen by humans. They are deployed by human organizations. Um, they are deployed by human actors like judges who often don't know what to do with the information that they're given. So this comes from Kathy O'Neill's fantastic book, Weapons of Math Destru Destruction. If you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. Um, but she basically says, and she's a mathematician um, who used to work on Wall Street, she basically says, you need to understand that an algorithm is not the real world. It's not some perfect scientific you know, truth. Um, it is a model of the real world in which humans choose the objective of the algorithm. They choose what to measure, including proxies. Um, they choose how to weight data points. I'm probably preaching to the choir in a room full of engineers. Um, they choose whether and how to check for accuracy or to incorporate change of information over time. And some things, some problems are very well suited to modeling and other problems are terribly suited to modeling or at least give rise to different kinds of failures. So baseball, incredibly well suited to modeling. Why? Yeah. Every pitch is a new data point. So you can predict, based on past activity, what the next pitch is going to be and how the hitter reacts to it or field person is. Yeah. So very, very detailed data gathered over a longer period of time, right? And accurate, detailed data. Um, baseball fans are incredible dorks. So they have all these statistics. Um, there are no proxies. You're actually measuring the thing that you want to predict, right? Um, there's constant data updating. And contrast this with a place where algorithmic decision making was actually <coughs> used. It's the, one of the first examples in O'Neill's book um, of evaluating teachers, public school teachers. So how is evaluating a teacher's performance, you're talking to a teacher, remember, um, very different from evaluating the likelihood somebody's going to hit a home run? You have to define what makes a good teacher, which is very objective. Yeah, it's incredibly hard to figure out what makes a good teacher. So, they were doing this um, based on student performance. They were measuring student performance through standardized tests. So already we have a proxy of a proxy, right? Um, and it turned out that in this particular, I think, I want to say it was DC, but I might be wrong. Um, so this, in this particular school system, there was rampant cheating on the standardized tests. So they were watching standardized test scores that have been really high coming from a school district where there was cheating plummet with this teacher who actually by all accounts was a really good teacher, so she gets fired. 
Um, so a few statistics, lots of proxies. There's very little data flow back into the system. So it's kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. Once they fire somebody, that person's been deemed to be a bad teacher. And there's no way to find out that they're actually a good teacher. Um, OK. So this brings us to uh, the literature in law uh, and policy about the problems with algorithms. I am by no means the first person to bring this up. Um, I sort of have taken an existing literature, tried to figure out where it was at, and then figured out how it intersects with current European law, which is one of the only places in the world where there actually is now law governing this stuff. And so in the so, United States, we are lagging behind. So behind. Um, and I can talk a little bit, I talk about that, that a little bit in my very last slide. Um, so Andrew Saltz and Solon Barakas wrote this interdisciplinary paper, 2016, um, called Big Data's Disparate Impact. So note, it's not called algorithmic fairness. It's actually about big data. And they talk about all the things I've already raised about um, effectively data science using bad objectives uh, or where they have accurate data, but they're using the machine learning system for things we don't actually societally normatively like. Or they have bad data, and that's the whole garbage in, garbage out idea. Um, where they get a data set that's free, but it's actually not a data set that's accurate. And because it's low cost, they use it, and they produce garbage decisions. Um, like with the teacher, they choose bad proxies. So choosing things like standardized tests to try to measure, measure whether a teacher is good. Um, or bad weighting in the sense that they weigh factors that normatively a community applying these in, say, the sentencing fa uh, context would not want to be using. So this then prompted, and actually Citron's before this, this prompted a number of proposed policy solutions um, where they were trying to do grapple with the fact that algorithms are really hard for law to handle um, because certain kinds of algorithms are opaque, uh, really technologically complex, and cannot be fixed ex post, meaning once they're built, you can't go back in and change um, certain attributes of them. So there's a certain randomness a contextuality to this kind of decision making, uh, and I'll come back to their solutions in a minute. All right, so as I said, this started as a comparative privacy slash data protection project, became a focus on this really strange little provision called Article 22 of the General Data Protection Regulation, which building on European fundamental rights conceptions of data privacy as being a dignitary right, allows you to tell a company that is making a solely automated decision about you, I want you to explain how that decision was made. Okay. So the right to explanation in Article 22 of the GDPR potentially seriously affects the ability of companies to use machine learning algorithms in Europe. Because if you build an algorithm that does not allow you to explain a result to an individual, you are in violation of data protection law and can be fined up to 4% of your worldwide net revenue. Mm. Okay. Um, so this then became a focus on algorithmic decision making more broadly. So I started with Article 22, then I looked across the GDPR. Um, and the project illuminated for me important features of how this like 190 page regulation plus gazillion uh, side explanations actually works in practice. Um, and this gives us, as we were saying, the US is lagging terribly behind on this. We don't have federal data privacy law, the first state omnibus data privacy law just went into effect in California in the beginning of this month. Um, but this points to a potential model and some flaws in the model when we're talking about what we should put in place in the United States. Okay, so bear with me. I'm gonna doop, go over this. Um, there have been lots of calls for regulating algorithmic decision making, as I noted. Those original calls, Danielle Citron, Frank Pasquale, their co-author pieces, largely focus on an Article 22-like right, which is to say, you get individual due process. Anybody have a general idea of what due process is? Fair hearing. Yeah, fair hearing, right? So you, have, you get to find out what the evidence is that was used against you. You get to contest the decision in some way. Um, but when you look at this early literature, they're actually not just talking about individuals. What's the problem with leaning heavily on individual due process to solve the kinds of problems that we've been talking about? You give me a right to contest an algorithmic decision, and you give me a right to get an explanation. I am not an engineer. I'm not a computer scientist. What am I going to do with this? <laughs> Right? It's locked. Yeah, I'm not going to understand it. I probably don't have the resources, either the intellectual resources, the technological resources, or the financial resources to do much with these rights. Um, and so individual due process has largely experienced a backlash in the policy literature, 
and been replaced by a lot of calls for instead something that I'm calling systemic transparency. So this is the idea that you do algorithmic audits or you bring in third parties to assess the system and test it. Um, or you do impact assessments, which my more recent work has focused on, um, where you're trying to figure out, you know, what is the actual impact of this inaction upon an affected community. Um, and these systemic transparency calls have been pretty harsh about the individual due process prong of this. Um, and when I started looking at the GDPR, I decided that that was actually a pretty significant mistake. So my first contribution of this project uh, has to do with trying to figure out why we want to regulate these systems at all. Right? I've largely been focusing on kind of the easiest calls for regulation, which is to prevent actual error or prevent bias. But it's more complex when you look at how people talk about these things. Um, and I claim that the calls for regulating algorithmic decision making actually stem from three different kinds of reasons. The first, and I'll go through each of these, the first is a dignitary or autonomy rationale. Um, a lot of this stuff reverberates with conversations about privacy more generally, but I'm applying it in the algorithmic uh, accountability context. So first is dignitary slash autonomy rationale. Second is what I call a justificatory rationale. Other people call this too. Um, and third is what we've been talking about so far, which is instrumental, which is let's make sure, that, sure this thing is not erroneous or biased. Okay. So the dignitary slash autonomy rationale, this is philosophy, you guys. Like, this is, you know, where law uh, really starts enjoying itself because we get to pretend without philosophy PhDs that we do philosophy. <laughs> um, so there are, again, this is kind of a combination of drawing from what's in the literature and what I actually think is going on here. Um, there are three versions of concerns about algorithmic decision making that trace back to concerns about objectification of people. Okay? Um, objectification being something that takes away the very nature of your humanness and turns you into a thing, right? Um, so the first one is very European, and most people in the U.S. look at this and go, including lawmakers, look at this and go, this is, this is crazy land. Um, but this is actually the source of the original version of this Article 22, etc. cetera. Uh, it was a French law in the 1970s um, that said, you know, basically, you've given me a number and taken away my name. If you use a machine to make a decision about me, that is treating me inherently like an object. I don't care if it's more accurate. I don't care if it's uh, less biased. That takes away my humanity. So that is a quintessentially, not all of Europe, but certain subparts of Europe, that is a quintessentially European notion, and most Americans react to it poorly. Um, a second, which I think is a little bit more relatable, is this idea that algorithmic decision making automatically puts you into a bucket, right? It's not about you. It's about a category in which you fall. And that might be a very small or specific category, um, but it is actually a lack of individualization because you've been reduced to proxies in some way. Um, and that this inherently, again, objectifies you uh, if you don't have an ability to sort of raise your hand and say you're wrong, right? So if it says, if they make a decision on me, um, I actually have an example, like semi-embarrassing. Um, so I own a Peloton. I know that ad was terrible. Um, but uh, so I regularly use this exercise machine, right? They get gathered data on how regularly I use this thing. Um, I also, in Boulder, happen to go outside and exercise a lot. And so when I'm not using the machine, I don't have a Fitbit, I don't have anything else that's tracking me, it has no way of knowing that I'm actually going out and exercising. It thinks I'm being lazy because I'm not using the machine. So let's say Peloton uh, contracts with a health insurance company, um, which is probably fine under US law. Um, so they contract with a health insurance company, uh, and they say, you know, this person is actually like plummeting in their physical activity. They may be making a decision based on thinking I fall in the category of lazy people when I'm actually falling into the category of very active, so they're just wrong, right? Um, so that's turned me into this object, which is just the data points from Peloton without allowing me to dynamically engage with that and say, that's not me. Okay. Um, then the last one is uh, really coming out of the data privacy law, last version of objectification, um, is the idea that simply having that data double out there, that version of me that is like the homunculus version of me, it's not actually me, um, that's all the data points that have been gathered, that robs me of my dignity because that's not me. That's an object. And this all ties into really US-based notions of autonomy, saying when this objectification has happened, we are fundamentally not free. Okay? We're fundamentally not free. We're not free because we're being offered 
crappy insurance rates. We're not free because we're being offered uh, targeted ads that suggest that we buy something or don't suggest that we buy something we might really like um, and being funneled into these little categories that we have no control over. Um, or we're being served political content that, again, uh, is influencing us without our actually having control over it. So this is the dignitary slash autonomy rationale. And I think it's interesting to see how most Americans begin by dismissing out of hand saying dignity, whatever. Um, and then as they walk through it, start thinking like, no, these are actually real problems. We maybe just don't frame them the same way the Europeans do. OK. Second, this is the last truly hard sort of semi-philosophical uh, aspect of this. There is a justificatory rationale. Um, so when we are subject to decision-making systems, including human decision-making systems like legal systems, um, we want them to explain to us how they make those decisions. Right? This is in part because we want to see the actual <coughs> reasoning. Uh, the example I have in the paper is police officer pulls you over and says, I pulled you over because your car reminds me of my ex-girlfriend's car. <coughs> right? That's not societally legitimized reasoning, right? He cannot pull me over for that reason. Um, and so when somebody makes a decision that has a significant effect on me, one of the things I'm going to ask for is let me see why you made that decision. There's also a systemic version of this, which is to say if some administrative agency makes some or some bureaucracy makes some really complicated decision about me and I don't have the capacity to actually assess their reasoning, I want them to show me that they're accountable to somebody who can do that. Right? So one reason why algorithmic decision making has been subject to calls for regulation um, is because we either ask individually, let me see the reasoning, or we want as a system to know somebody else is doing that work for us. Last but not least, we'll just go through this briefly. This is what I was saying before. Um, this is the fix the algorithm so it's less biased, more accurate, not using dirty data, et cetera. So that's the instrumental rationale for regulating. All right. So punchline, um, you can't just do this with systemic governance. You also can't just do this with individual due process. You have to use both if you want to get all three of those reasons um, targeted. So algorithmic due process, which is a series of individual rights um, based on procedural due process, gets at the dignitary autonomy concerns. Um, and gets at some of the justificatory concerns. <coughs> because it allows an individual who's subject to one of these decisions to say, show me your reasoning and don't objectify me. Right? Um, I'll come back to that. Prong two is systemic governance. And this is done, I know this is a lot of like really wonky policy terms. Um, this is done in the European Union uh, and a lot of suggested policy pro proposals, even though they don't know it through a type of governing called collaborative governance or new governance, which is effectively establishing public-private partnerships with the private sector. So it's not the same thing as handing it off to the private sector and saying, you figure out how to solve all these problems. Um, but what they're asking for instead is, we're going to develop a collaborative relationship where the government doesn't have to absorb the cost of learning this technology internally. Um, and we'll come in and spot check you to make sure you're actually held accountable to the public when you end up trying to get rid of bias, discrimination, et cetera. So in practice, what this looks like when you look at a legal system that's designed to do this, um, there may be softer forms of governance, including encouragement of codes of conduct um, or of, of standards or of certification, including certification bodies. And then there are informal versions of this where the government might write something saying, like a law, this is really just hypothetical, but a law saying algorithms should be fair. Right? That doesn't actually tell the private sector what to do. The private sector has to fill in the gap of like, what the heck does fair mean? Right? And that may involve, again, as an industry trying to decide what fairness is, or talking to a number of external experts, or bringing in academics to try to determine what that term is. It's not the government saying, here's bullet point by bullet point what you have to do, um, is trying to engage those in the private sector to help it figure out what a good version of this should look like. OK. Um, so collaborative governance is better suited than individual due process for governing risk across an entire system, um, for governing systems that change really fast. Because if you just challenge things with individual decisions, there's no way to get that quickly back into how you design a system overall. Um, it's touted as better suited for governing technologically complex, complex systems because the government doesn't have to figure out how machine learning works. They're trying to harness private sector expertise that's going to be paid better anyway. Um, but the key for all of this to work 
is that that system has to have some public facing accountability. Otherwise, you end up with the private sector essentially self-regulating and not being held accountable to the public at large. OK. Um, go back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, governing fast changes systems, iterative governance. Yes. My sense of govern, gov governance is that it moves almost at a glacial speed. Yep. And mm -hmm. so, I mean, new things are emerging, new technologies. Yep. Fast slower, yep. quantum computing, and I cannot imagine that you can do that check essentially at speed to check, and, yep. and so. so. So let me explain. So I'm going to use the law, hypothetical law that says algorithms should be fair as the example, right? <coughs> if you as a government try to write technical standards into your actual law, you are doomed for exactly this reason, right? If the actual law, which Congress has taken in my hypothetical 20 years to enact, um, says algorithms shall do X, Y, and Z, um, then it's going to take another 20 years to amend it, uh, and it will be outpaced by technology. If you write into the law, algorithms must be fair, um, then you can have an agency like the Federal Trade Commission come out with guidance. Guidance is not law. Guidance is just saying, we might enforce against this if you do this badly, right? <laughs> um, and so, so that agency can repeatedly issue updated guidance, can hold workshops, with the private sector to update what that guidance will look like and can iterate more quickly than if you put this in the actual books. Um, so the GDPR, weirdly, the European version of this, weirdly kind of does this, um, even though many people have looked at it from afar and said, like, this thing is a behemoth. It's never going to work. It's going to be outpaced by technology. There's so many broad standards in it. And there, it, there are multiple specialized agencies that are constantly issuing guidance. Um, which allows them to be more nimble than you would think, given that it's a 193-page law. Um, okay, so in the interest of time and letting you guys actually ask me questions, um, I want to come to the point about the, the GDPR itself. So the General Data Protection Regulation, it's actually laid out like this, right? It's striking to me that nobody really said this before me, um, because the first, like, 20-something uh, articles of the GDPR are just clearly individual rights. They're individual rights of access to data. Um, they're individual rights of correction, et cetera. Um, but they also include individual rights specific to algorithms, or algorithmic decision making. And the second half is all collaborative governance duties that are imposed on companies. So this includes things like you have to revise your corporate structure um, so that you have a data privacy officer, data protection officer. Um, you need to conduct risk assessments internally. You need to report to an agency um, that you're using an algorithm that raises a high risk of things we're concerned about, like discrimination, et cetera. And often, as I just mentioned, the substance isn't actually there in the law. The substance is a broad standard um, that will say something like, use suitable measures to mitigate risks. And then you, as a company, have to try to figure out, in conversation with the regulator, in conversation with other people in the industry, in conversation with experts, um, what the heck that means. What do suitable measures mean? Um, and so that becomes this iterative process that I'm talking about. So I'll leave this. Um, the punchline yep, uh, is that the GDPR doesn't have public transparency, because fundamentally, it's supposed to be a privacy law. So all those individual rights have lots of transparency or information flows, but they only go to individual people. They don't go to oversight boards. The places where the GDPR, or really the regulations around it, uh, or the guidance around it, start mentioning things that might actually make collaborative governance work, they're all soft suggestions. They're not requirements. So for example, um, the guidance on algorithmic accountability suggests very strongly that you do audits of your algorithms. It suggests that you uh, bring in external experts as you're building the algorithm, algorithmic system, um, and suggests sort of a cycle of accountability where there is external oversight, but the main mechanisms are never made available to the public. So the question I walked away with this, uh, from this with is, can a system that where the company duties um, are really being taken pretty seriously by companies because of the risk of these huge fines, where the companies have to actually kind of come up with the substance of the law that governs them, can that work if you don't have public-facing accountability and instead only have individualized transparency rights? Um, so with that, I'll leave it and let you guys ask any questions you might have. So let's thank our speaker, please.
it seems to me that the policy universe is unbelievably philosophical, difficult, and wow. I think I should be frightened uh, again. But <laughs> questions, comments, assertions, philosophical entreaties, or policy comments. I'll, I'll kick one off while the students are thinking about it. Um, David Reed, by the way. <laughs> um, what, so how easy is it to figure out whether something is actually, a decision is being made based on machine learning? Because yeah. it's becoming more and more embedded in a lot of different ways, there are a lot of different techniques that are used for prediction for yeah. machine learning. So how, you're, I love the way you tee up, should we regulate this or not? Perfect, those who take my class, get that, right? But how do you know what's the trigger point? Yeah, so I think there are two, and again, I'm coming at this through European law, right? Um, which is the only law that actually really exists around this right now. Brazil enacted a mimic of it, but it's not really in effect. Um, so there are two threshold questions that happen here when you're looking at this from a legal perspective. The first is that uh, Article 22 of the GDPR applies only to solely automated decisions. So if you have a hybrid machine learning human decision, the question is, is this, are these accountability measures, not even the, you know, should you explain it to a person, but the real deep, like, you should have oversight and do risk assessments, et cetera, is that going to apply? Um, and first of all, it seems like the risk assessment portion of it will apply even if you're using it in conjunction with human decision making. So all this is risk assessment by a company. You know, they need to decide how likely is it that a European regulator is actually going to figure out that we're using this. Um, they need to decide how high is the risk of harm when we're using this. Um, this is how you end up employing my students and having lots of lawyers in-house. Uh, and then, the, so the second, <laughs> the second um, issue, though. Um, <laughs> cybersecurity and policy students should take courses in the law school. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yep, <laughs> totally. Um, and I teach info privacy and cybersecurity uh, in the fall. Um, but the, the other threshold, so there's the solely automated question. Um, and there really is a question with respect to the individual due process rights. Um, some people are arguing it only applies when it's just made by machine learning. The regulators have kind of hinted uh, that they believe that if you're just having a human rubber stamp the decision, that's still going to fall under that law. The other question, which is I think the more difficult one, is that it applies only to decisions with a significant effect on people. So there's an argument that targeted advertising in most contexts doesn't have a significant effect on me. Right? Like cumulatively it might. But the individual decision is not affecting me the same way that like, a bank's decision to deny me a loan is going to affect me. Um, and so those are kind of the two, you know, those are the things that Europe has put down as the two ways in which machine learning gets covered by this, these laws. Um, and it's unclear that that will happen to the same degree in the United States. So um, obviously an expert system that's assigning a diagnosis in health. This is a really interesting one. Yeah. Right? That yeah. shown to significant effect. To have positive. Yeah. That would have um, clearly uh, would be under this type of a, a regulation versus say another really successful and positive expert system is traffic skip like yep. skip where it's not really personal. Right. You're you know, unless you, re you choose to run the red light. Yeah, so for, for the GDPR to be triggered, it has to be personal data. So it has to be personally identifiable information. Right. So the traffic light system's out of it. A whole bunch of like telecom management. So in the future with automated yeah. cars, you may know who's, sure. which yeah. car, right? Yeah. Um, I think the health question is the hardest one. There are public health exceptions in the GDPR. Um, so again, to the fact that like it's not a set of clear rules, it's a whole bunch of balancing standards. My gut is that if you have a doctor using a cancer diagnostic system, um, that they're probably going to be able to argue their way out of Article 22, either because an individual member state writes a law that says that, um, or because they're going to get out via a public health exception. Yeah. Yes. Um, I don't know much about law, but um, I was curious why this doesn't violate the Civil Rights Act of 1964, because I thought that forbade inequality of outcomes. Yeah, so that's actually the SELPS piece that I referenced earlier. Um, so the disparate impact uh, analysis in the United States um, means that, this is, in short, this is not fully my area of law, I don't do employment law, 
um, or, or strictly speaking, constitutional law. But it means that there's a defense for businesses when they make a decision uh, that has a disparate impact on a protected class. Um, they can come and say, basically, there was a business reason for this, or I think it's business necessity. And they can do that through stats. So there's this circularity to it where it's like, oh, you know, I made a decision. It happens to impact African Americans more. However, I did it because of math, right? Like, that's the way the legal system is currently built in our anti-discrimination law. Yeah. yeah. Can you give an example? I, I'm, kind of, I'm kind of confused. Like, what kind of statistics could they use to justify yeah, so I mean, basically, if they say like an actuarial system showed me that these are the people that I should be offering the job to based on these non-racial categories, and that happens to impact race, um, that's a potential exception under our civil rights law. Huh. Yeah. Uh, so with both machine learning and AI, it can be really challenging to interrogate this to yep. explain why it made the decision it did. <clears throat> so kind of drawing a parallel to cybersecurity where we kind of just openly developed stuff for 30 years and then kind of securing it, um, how could policy or governance help put us in a position to make sure that we don't make that same mistake where we're essentially trying to establish that stuff today yeah. by 20 years from now finding out that our algorithms have been discriminatory for 20 yeah, I mean, I think that's um, the inflection point that we're at, if not have already passed. So what's really interesting about what Europe is doing, it's not just the European Union. There's also the European, um, oh, what the heck is it called? There's like civil rights bodies, the European Court of Human Rights. There's other civil rights bodies that are looking at this. Um, and they are basically saying, we in Europe are going to try to build AI that has European values, right? Um, and so they're trying to, part of that is, economic self-interest, right? It's saying the US AI companies that don't comply with this are not allowed in the European Union functionally. Um, so that's absolutely you know, a trade strategy also. Um, but in the US, we've largely in policy steered away from something called the precautionary principle, um, where you know, when something seems to be dangerous, we start by banning it and then incrementally give, it, give permission to do it. That's a very European approach, or at least older European approach. Um, in the US, really in the last like 40 or 50 years, our approach has been wait and see if there's any harm. And then when you have the huge explosion or you have the huge harm, then step in and try to regulate after the fact. And I can't tell you, this is expanding to data privacy more generally. I can't tell you how many policy conversations I've been in that have just focused on whether there is privacy harm full stop um, before you can get to a productive conversation on whether there should be regulation. Yeah. Um. Policy, technology, and cybersecurity, fundamental. Professor Brinsky has told us that she will be teaching a course in the fall in Wolf Law. I will try to get information and send it out to the TCP students, both current and future, because technology, cybersecurity, and policy are everywhere. So please, let's thank our speaker.